Bueno, pues eh, buenas tardes, buenos días, depende de dónde estéis. Bienvenidos a un nuevo webinar de los que estamos organizando conjuntamente eh, Technology Evaluation Centers e it-latino.net. Ah, ya sabéis que estamos organizando webinars tanto en inglés como en español. Ah, en este caso, ah, pues el webinar es en inglés. ¿Mm? Eh, bueno, os digo que el webinar se está, um, se está grabando, recibiréis todos la grabación uh, pues, uh, mañana o pasado mañana de, del webinar. Uh, tendremos una presentación por parte del, del speaker y posteriormente pasaremos a un turno de preguntas. ¿eh? Las preguntas o los comentarios uh, podréis hacerlos tanto en español como en inglés. Uh, porque tenemos, uh, no seré yo, ¿eh? tenemos una, una presentadora, una persona al lado de Michael que nos hará de eh, la traducción en caso de que sea necesario. ¿eh? O sea que podéis hacer eh, vuestros comentarios o vuestras eh, dudas, las podéis plantear tanto en inglés como en español. Bueno, um, You know that we today have um, Michael Thaw, who, which is uh, Vice President of Selection Services in Technology Evaluation Centers. He's in uh, Montreal, isn't it, Michael? Montreal, Canada. Okay, Montreal, Canada. Um, and he's going to speak a little bit about ERP implementation failures result resulting in massive losses of Uh, five key repeated errors. ¿Eh? Bueno, eh, va a hablar un poquito sobre eh, problemas a evitar a la hora de eh, implementar eh, proyectos RP. ¿Eh? Ok, Ma Michael, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Nearly half of all ERP implementations fail the first time around. Now, this is significant, and so is the investment and the impact that ERP has on your business. So let's take a second to just think about this before we go any further. Deploying an ERP system is an expensive proposition, not just in terms of the dollars, but also in terms of the dedicated resources and the time. You know, an ERP system is about the most expensive, time-consuming and complicated tasks that your organization is going to take on. It's going to cost hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, and it's going to take hundreds to thousands of hours to set up and deploy. It's a huge investment of money, resources, and time. Successfully implementing the ERP will help your organization streamline workflows and cut costs. But make no bones about it. A poorly planned and implemented ERP rollout can severely uh, affect costs in the organization in terms of Uh, loss of productivity and delays. You know, this webinar is going to focus on repeated mistakes that occur in ERP implementation failures. The real life examples that I'm going to show will impact these failures and the lessons learned. And most importantly, at the end of the webinar, I want to share some guidelines and tips on how to avoid these types of failures. Uh, Daniel introduced me a moment ago. I'm Michael Thaw. I'm the Vice President of Selection Services at TEC Technology Evaluation Centers. And we are an impartial advisory company that helps businesses find the best fit solutions to support their digital and transformation, um, their uh, business and digital transformations. So before I get started, I just wanted to say that th there's lots of examples to choose from. And I chose five that were very significant and that definitely could have been avoided. So let's start. Um, I have a dramatic example to begin with. And, and the first lesson is really about setting realistic goals and focusing on business issues. And uh, Nike is this first dramatic example. They're the largest athletic shoe company. Everybody's familiar with them um, in the world. And they're, um, ERP implementation upgrade didn't go so well. It cost them $400 million to upgrade the system. And in the process, they lost $100 million 
their stock value dropped 20 percent and there were numerous class action lawsuits and at the heart of this was the i2 supply chain software implementation failure so what went wrong well problems began when the system forecasted the wrong product kevin garnett shoes instead of michael jordan air jordan shoes so imagine the retailers were receiving delivery of the wrong product, one that went unsold, but the product that was in demand, they weren't able to get. And this was about deploying an unproven approach to their business. You see, their business was really uh, based on, Nike's success was based on purchasers and retailers committing to orders in advance of delivery. And Nike's objective here was to re reduce that delivery time from nine months down to six months. What the I2 solution did, and it was a predictive crystal ball forecasting approach, it didn't fit well with Nike's model. It was untested and uh, this led to that failure. So what really went wrong? Why did it go wrong? Well, Nike didn't take the normal patients that they had used to make their business successful in this implementation and a system upgrade. So ahead of their SAP implementation, they decided to install I2 into their legacy system. Now, it didn't go well. There was a cascade of problems, as you can see on the screen, and uh, that resulted in um, them um, not, um, not being able to ship the right products to um, end users and to have all sorts of problems. So when they finally refocused the business on their core values on their on what worked for them on their success formula and uh, tightening the supply chain they got back on track and this cost them an additional 400 million and five years later now did this need to take so long did it need to cost them so much and give them so much trouble um, especially to be able to optimize their business so so really the lesson here about setting realistic goals and focusing on business issues is getting the technology to support the business and um, ensuring that you're able to set realistic goals early on. Um, and um, in, in Nike's case, this supply chain management concept was just not proven in their business. And then take the time to test, to test the system and get the kinks out before you, you move forward in the implementation. And that includes all the integrations and making sure that your people are sufficiently trained in the process. Um, the next lesson is about standardizing um, processes. Choose standard processes and easy workflow. Now, Avon, I'm sure you're familiar with this name. They're the world's largest direct selling business. And they've been in business for almost 100 years, relying on millions of door-to-door -door representatives to sell their health and beauty products. And, and this is done internationally. So they're a multi-level marketing um, company that that this revenues are directly dependent on supporting these representatives, making it as easy as possible to place orders and distribute them to the customers. Now, their goal was to set up an order management system where their representatives could input orders directly through mobile devices into their supply chain so that the products could be shipped to their customers even faster. Well, what happened in reality was that um, the system was so complicated to use that the reps just simply stopped selling for the company and um, it had a huge impact, a huge impact. It cost the company $125 million. And what really went wrong here was that the implementation was focused on a lot of bells and whistles, a lot of non-differentiating functions. What they really needed was differentiators like digitizing the sales process on their mobile devices. And this just wasn't usable, it wasn't workable for the reps. And there's a difference between outside reps and internal employees. So these, uh, you know, the, the mobile platform in reality just made it a lot more complex and then the opposite result was achieved. And, and what's really amusing about all of this is that IT and the vendor believed that this project was a success because it technically worked even though it wasn't usable. So the lesson, the takeaway from this 
is to avoid non-differentiators non when it comes to setting up ERP systems. Focus on the tried and true standard processes. And they have to support your business. So um, it's all about making it easy to use so that the users want to use the and adopt the new system. And that way, um, they're trained and transitioned properly into it so that it's successful and you can reach your objectives. Managing expectations. So I, I have a, a shocking and extreme example for you. And this is one of the United States Air Force. This mess drained more than a billion dollars from public coffers. So the project was about automating and streamlining logistics operations. And, and this was about being able to track all of their physical assets, airplanes, fuels, spare parts. They were consolidating um, information and replacing 200 separate legacy systems. So the long and short of it is that seven years and a billion dollars later, the Air Force decided to stop the project before it was complete. And scope creep was really at the heart of what happened here. And to complicate that, there was massive turnover in the process of employees. So what really went wrong here? Well, originally, the Air Force contracted and awarded Oracle with an $88 million contract for their off-the-shelf software. And CSC, Computer Science Corporation, was to implement, to integrate the system into Air Force's infrastructure. Well, with lots of scope creep and personnel turnover and the problems that came from that, they ended up spending a billion dollars and yielding no result. And the worst part was to finish this off, they estimated it would take another billion dollars. So the lesson here is that strict management of expectations of budgets, timelines, and resources will help prevent these types of disasters. You know, understand the size and the scope of your project at the very beginning. Set clear limits and know exactly when your ERP system is getting out of hand. And scope creep is one of the biggest hurdles. So manage expectations um, amongst employees and executives and do this out of the gate. This is critical for success. The next lesson is about doing impartial due diligence um, in um, choosing the right solutions and the right partners. And waste management is a prime example here. This is the biggest company of its kind uh, in North America. They decided, they decided that they were going to partner with one of the largest global vendors to implement a new ERP solution. And they agreed on an 18-month implementation cycle without having to customize it. The estimated cost was $100 million, and the expectation, the return on investment that they were expecting was between $100 and $200 million. Well, that never happened. And then um, all sorts of lawsuits began. Now, in reality, both sides were to blame. So what happened? Well, waste management alleged that SAP didn't deliver the software as promised. They misrepresented the software. They demonstrated fake software, software that didn't, um, that wasn't commercially available. And this, this is according to public records. And SAP claimed that waste management had ducked its responsibilities that they weren't able to define the requirements or to provide sufficient resources to and, and that were knowledgeable and had the decision-making power to be able to collaborate throughout the project. So for the lessons here, well, let's ask ourselves a couple of questions. You know, what did the vendor promise and what responsibility did waste management have here? And, and the reality is that it's up to waste management. It's their $100 million. It's their project. It's their business. They have to do their due diligence. And that means properly evaluating, selecting, contracting, and working through the implementation with the vendor. And, and part of that evaluation and selection is about being able to do the proper requirement gathering and buying in from their 
user community to understand what the solutions can and can't do out of the box, to be able to understand the experience of the vendor in this space and uh, of the implementation partner, and to be able to check those references, to be able to do um, on-site visits, to be able to create a scripted demonstration that shows, that would have showed waste management's key processes and keystroke by keystroke, see how um, the process was performed by the vendor and also check the audit trails of the vendor, have them use their data and challenge them that this is out of the box functionality. And then furthermore, um, this has to be able to, the evaluation and selection has to be able to play out in the contracts. So protecting yourself is about building in, clarifying the deliverables, building in escape clauses if things are not working. And also, I would say um, the biggest impact is, is aligning payments with deliverables. So these are some of the things that um, would have been much more effective in, in uh, eliminating this uh, and, and being able to get them to make this work. Lesson number five, and this is my last lesson, uh, is to formulate a contingency plan and manage risk. So Hewlett Packard is an example. The cost of their failed project was $160 million, but the damages were five times that amount. That's a pretty big number. And the goal that they were working on was to be able to have one place where orders from different systems could be combined. So this was really a perfect storm of smaller issues that combined to undermine the entire process. They attempted to install several ERP systems that would simplify the customer ordering process and, and realize some cost savings for them. Well, what happened was not only did the implementation not go well, but the additional stress of an increase in demand for their products just put so much pressure and they ended up not being able to deliver. Now HP witnessed a slow disaster happen. They saw uh, one by one their systems where uh, they just failed to integrate. And this cat had a cascade of problems. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects here was that early on HP's employees um, suggested that this was a very high risk project. But regardless, um, HP um, deployed it and with the addition of the uh, increase in their business and their ERP team and their IT team was so busy trying to get the ERP system to work that they couldn't respond to the increase in demand. So regardless of the fact that they wanted to fly product to customers or direct the business through their distributors, they still weren't able to live up to the empty promises that they made. And understand this, that, that the IT and business could have collaborated much better. And the lesson here is being able to make sure that the planning is set up properly to support the business, that you have to be able to manage risks and build in a contingency plan. And their, their CIO, Bouchard, he said that had the contingency plan um, take into consideration extra weeks to deploy the, the solution, that, would, that might have made all the difference. And then make sure that you're testing the solution before it goes live. And remember that um, you know, the role here is to be proactive during implementation. They, amongst all of these examples, there were there were some common challenges that I kind of wanted to, to focus on for just a second. And, and one of them is setting and managing expectations, both internally and externally in your company. So determine what you want to get in the end of the project. And that means defining what success is at every stage and measuring it during each of the milestones. And also, defining what failure is. And then we're going to try and understand the impact of cost, timing, and quality. You know, what do you want to get out of this project? You can have it cheap, you can have it on time, or you can have it well done. There has to be some give and take. 
identify the right and leverage the right people and partners. And this is throughout every step, through the evaluation, through the implementation, the training, the go live, and all the change management. And understand how data is going to impact these timelines. So I, I want to get to the point where we can talk about guidelines and tips about how to avoid these disasters. And let's start with executive leadership. Let's start at the top. Having executives being able to support um, the organization at every step is key. So their support to be able to uh, give you the resources, the time, the budget to be able to work through the due diligence, evaluation, and selection, and right through implementation. And the executives need to be involved in terms of being able to understand what the risks are and be able to help in decision making with those key risks because they're going to have an impact. There's going to be some trade offs and they need to know what they are and make those hard decisions. The next step is about being able to do your due diligence to identify the best fit solution. And this is all about being able to go through the proper evaluation and selection where you can um, do the proper requirement gathering and define the scope clearly that'll play out in the right implementation to affect the scope creep. And it's about being able to get buy-in from the different users to begin the change management that has to happen. But the idea is to be able to make an informed decision through a due diligence process that will allow you to understand what you're getting and you're not getting and be able to tie this into contracts and clarify the deliverables that protect you and um, make sure that there is no surprises. And part of that selecting the best fit solution is choosing the right implementer, the right system integrator. And we've seen in these examples because each one of these lawsuits had large names. So just because you're using a large name as an integrator or an implementer doesn't guarantee success. So it's really a matter of assessing the experience and strategy. Make sure that the implement implementation team is not going to substitute juniors where seniors are required on the project. And um, this is all about being able to make sure that there's a good corporate culture fit that you can work together really well with the uh, implementers. This is really a key point, making sure that you're in charge. This is your project. And this is all about project management. So if things are not going well during the implementation, it's up to you to course correct or fire the implementers. It's about being able to properly manage the risks and go with tried and true processes that will help uh, create efficiencies and optimize your business. Don't, you don't need to be uh, adopting early technology that hasn't been proven. And it's about being able to dedicate resources to the project. Now, most organizations are under resources, but I can't emphasize this point enough. Dedicating the right teams for selection, for who's involved in the projects throughout, and that they are competent and qualified, that they're amongst your best people, um, will make sure that the project's a success. Because, you know, you're being able to attend to the daily urgencies of your business is key. It, look, consider this challenge that you're trying to run your business while you're trying to set up a, a strategic project at the same time. That's quite a stress on the organization. So dedicating resources will prevent interruptions and that's the biggest risk to, um, to uh, your project. Focusing on business process management. And the idea here is to be able to, um, bear with me for a second, to be able to define your business processes and operations. And if you can define them, then you'll have the technology support those business processes. And that, that's what this technology, that's what deploying the new technology is all about. It's about supporting the business effectively. And um, the next 
key aspect is really user accepted testing. Each one of the examples that I talked about earlier, had they had stringent user accepted testing, they might not have failed. And so test often and thoroughly and stress the systems before they go live because it's easier to fix the problems in advance than the effort it takes after the fact. You have to plan for change management and that planning starts from the very beginning of the project involving users and getting them to buy into the process, how the decisions are being made, what the decision is, and preparing them for the challenges that will happen during implementation. And change management has to be woven into every step of the evaluation and selection and the implementation. And all the training that goes along with making sure that they're ready to use the system before it goes live. But this is all about the adoption and transformation of your business. And finally, um, leverage outside resources. This will help you make sure that you can keep your project on track. You'll have an advocate in your corner that'll help you manage risks, that'll make you aware of things that you haven't thought of. It's about ensuring that what you purchased is really set up properly on time and on budget. And so companies like tech can help you mitigate and manage those risks um, during implementation and uh, during uh, evaluation and selection and implementation. Now, uh, at following this webinar, we're going to be able to send around some emails to allow you to download additional assets around your projects. And uh, I welcome you to share your thoughts and challenges um, and success factors that we didn't really talk about that you'd like to discuss. So, a final thought here is that the money that you're going to spend after go live to get the system right is going to be significant and so is the time and it's going to be much greater than the time that you would have spent before go live thank you very much and uh i'd like to open the floor to some questions okay michael thank you very much uh yes we we enter in the q q a Uh, bueno, como os he dicho, podéis eh, hacer las preguntas en inglés o en español, como os sintáis más cómodos. Y eh, os informo de que podéis eh, entrar vía micrófono, levantáis la mano, accionando el botoncito levantar mano, que aparece en el panel de control de GoToWebinar. Hay como un iconito que, bueno, aparece la mano, uh, una mano levantada. Y uh, si me accionáis ese iconito, yo os abro el micrófono. ¿eh? Os animo directamente a participar por micrófono. No se ve la webcam, o sea que tranquilos. ¿eh? Es solo eh, vía micrófono. ¿eh? O si no, pues también podéis plantear uh, las preguntas eh, por el chat. ¿eh? Recordar, podéis levantar la mano accionando el iconito levantar mano que aparece en el panel de control de GoToWebinar. Ok, I have uh, some question here. Uh, Michael, there is a question about uh, request for proposals. Uh, uh, Javier asks, uh, what, did, what is your opinion about uh, RFIP, request for proposal? It is critical to, to confront a, a, a software project, or maybe there is a danger of wasting too much time on it. No, absolutely. The request for proposal is a very critical part, Javier. And the idea is this. The request for proposal is part of the due diligence that you do during evaluation and selection. It not only establishes the, the and communicates the scope clearly to the competing vendors and implementers, but it also clarifies um, exactly the requirements that you need. And it has the vendor and the implementer declare all of the deliverables and the costs from a total cost of ownership perspective that would help you understand what it would cost for their solution. And this gives you the basis for being able to properly compare one solution against the other to leverage them for your negotiation, but also to make sure that everything's included. Because the objective here is to get to the know, get to the understanding about 
what is the total cost of ownership for the next three or five years? Okay, uh, I have uh, a question for you, Michael. Uh, normally, you suppose that companies are not so transparent uh, uh, about their failures uh, on pro software projects, okay? But uh, I think that it is a very interesting uh, information for all, all of us uh, that uh, are in that are trying to implement any any kind of software do you have any from tech do you have any kind of i don't know a, a investigation department on failures projects uh, how do how do you know failure projects because i, I suppose that a companies that they don't they don't explain you hey we have uh, this this uh, problem with the implementation and at least they they don't want you to publicize it. That's a that's a great question, and it's a very important topic, Daniel. And the idea is this: that these are very complicated exercises doing an ERP implementation. It requires a lot of moving parts: the implementer, the company, and um, the system integrator, the the vendor. There's a lot of moving parts here. Everybody has a role to play. And if uh, anybody doesn't show up and play their role, then this can't be successful. And so we've seen scenarios where they choose the perfect solution, but they're too busy during the business to set it up properly. And the implementer had to go on their own and make some assumptions and they set it up and it didn't really work. So everybody has a role to play and uh, there's no guarantee of success without uh, making sure that you're focused um, and everybody's focused on doing this correctly and properly from the beginning ok uh, os recuerdo podéis hacer las preguntas en español o en inglés uh, y se las eh, plantearemos a michael y os animo a participar directamente vía micrófono eh, levantáis la mano accionando el iconito levantar mano aquí que tenemos ahora a Michael eh, bueno pues dispuesto a responder vuestras dudas y yo os abro el micrófono eh. no, no se va a ver eh, la webcam solo veis la webcam de Michael y mía uh, pero no la vuestra o sea que os animo a participar directamente vía micrófono eh, ahora que tenéis la oportunidad eh. en el momento que vea una mano levantada os abro el micro venga no no, no os preocupéis tampoco del idioma porque la podéis plantear en, en español perfectamente y se la trasladamos a, a Michael eh, en inglés. Ok, Michael, uh, it would be very interesting to, to organize some, a series of webinars about different failure projects, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> It would be, uh, we have to very learn from those mistakes and not repeat them. <laughs> well, it's, it's the more interesting thing uh, to learn from mistakes. Okay. Okay. Here I have a question about uh, from Faber. Uh, uh, Victoria, te voy a pedir que me que me traduzcas. Te la voy a leer. Okay. Sí, listo. Dice en su experiencia qué puede ser más más riesgoso o qué puede conllevar más riesgo. Implementar un RP por módulos y realizar salidas a producción de, made, de, made, de manera controlada o implementar todos los módulos al tiempo. Es decir, podemos resumirlo, eh, eh, Victoria, en qué sí. recomienda Michael si afrontar una implementación poco a poco de un RP o hacerlo todo de golpe. Uh, Michael, they would like to know, the question is, in your experience, which is better, implementing a solution phase by phase, model by model, or going, jumping full force in and doing a full-blown ERP implementation all at once? I, I would say that the, the, uh, there's a mixed audience, there's a mixed reaction, and, and this really should be discussed with the implementers, with some live examples. Now, I was reading... Um, uh, some information uh, recently that uh, showed that uh, a phased approach was much better at doing this and uh, allow, it allows you to be able to control it. But I would, I would tell you that it depends, that there's no simple answer to that question. So it really depends on the scope of the project, on your corporate culture, and also um, on managing the risks 
and um, how mission critical this is. So um, I, I'm sorry, there's not a clear answer for that. It, 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 you, you really need to look at the specific scenario to give you a, a best case. Okay, uh, this is another question, uh, Victoria. Sí. Um, es algo así como es, es de José. Um, el, el, el hecho de que cada vez más haya implementaciones cloud de RP o de otro tipo de software, pero en el caso del RP, eh, pues todavía más, ¿no? ¿Esto puede facilitar eh, eh, que los proyectos sean menos dificultosos o, o menos problemáticos? ¿O no? ¿Él considera que es un poco lo mismo un proyecto eh, RP Cloud o un, un, un proyecto RP on-premise? Excelente question. Uh, José, would like to know if an ERP implementation via the cloud would be um, easy to facilitate versus something that's on-premise. Does it make it more complicated or is it easier to adapt to because it's in the cloud? José, thank you for the question and, it, and it's a great question. And so, you know, um, in order to be able to give you the answer, you have to look at the, the, the picture and, and details are very important here. So are you willing to accept out of the box functionality? Because if you are, then a cloud deployment can be very rapid. But if you need a lot of extra configuration, then you might want it on premise. And it's also a matter of, you know, do you trust the security? And then you want to look at the economics of this also. You want to understand that um, a subscription paced approach might be more expensive in the long run, although it can be applied to operational costs up front. And um, in terms of being able to answer your question, Um, quickly, if you don't have the internal IT resources, then deploying it in the cloud will will get will get you up and running quicker. Okay, gracias, eh, José. Uh, no sé, Victoria, si tienes alguna pregunta por ahí para para Michael. Lo digo en español primero, también o solo en inglés. Okay, dile en español primero y luego la la pones en inglés. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, Michael. <laughs> I'll ask them in Spanish so that the audience knows as well. Um, so, mi primera pregunta sería, ¿cómo puedes definir quién, uh, cómo puedes asignar el gente a la evaluación o durante este proceso si no tienes el gente interna al principio? So, how do you allocate alloc people Um, for a project of this sort of evaluation and selection when you're understaffed as it as is. But well, this is typical. This is really typical because I don't know a company that has enough resources to go around. And that's a great question. But understand my opening statement that how significant these projects are. You know, you're going to spend a lot of money. It's going to have a, a huge impact on your business. This is mission critical. Your business can't run without this. The, the, the cost of not doing well is so significant that a few extra thousand dollars to dedicate the right resources to make this successful are the difference between success and failure. So I would tell you, even if you're under-resourced, built into your budget should be the dedicated resources to make sure that this goes well. Thank you, Michael. Another question I have is, uh, given to that, is ¿cómo sabes quién debe de estar dedicado a este proyecto? How do you know who should be dedicated to this project? Or to, excuse me, let me rephrase that. How do you know who should be a dedicated resource to this project? So obviously you have your business to run in the process and you um, need to put high quality people on this project. So it's a matter of being able to Either make sure that you can cover them um, in your business or make sure that you bring them in to work on this. But the idea is that they need to be um, the stronger people in your company that are participating and leading the project to make sure that it goes well. And that'll be part of the adoption as well to make sure that it's set up properly and that it's done effectively. This will, this will add to the efficiency and uh, compress the time that it takes to go live. 
I have a question about for um, distribution and retail companies. Esta pregunta sería para la industria de distribución, para una empresa que está involucrada involucrado involucrado en eh, distribución que no maneja proyectos con tal, ¿cómo es que Tech sugería que evalúan una o que hacen un proyecto de esta manera? So for a company that's involved in the wholesale and distribution that is not used to managing um, projects, how would you suggest or how would tech suggest that they go about this? Okay, well, this actually extends beyond distribution and, manu uh, and retail companies. You know, any, any company that's not used to managing projects that embarks upon an ERP implementation, they need to figure out how to do project management. And so they, they want to bring in an, outs, uh, an, uh, an outside resource to help them with project management because managing the project is about making this successful. And, and think of what project management really involves. It involves a project plan with clear objectives, timelines that support the timeline that you want to go live on, and, and the activities that outline um, the phases, the milestones that you're going to reach, and what the resource requirement is. There's a lot of moving parts here and being able to make sure that you have decision gates at each of the milestones. In order to be able to do this, if you're not used to managing resources and projects effectively like that, bringing in outside resources, either hiring dedicated project managers, um, project managers or companies like TEC to be able to assist you during the uh, implementation will make all the difference. Uh, speaking to that of the implementation, Michael, uh, de, hablando de parte de la implementación, ¿cómo es que uno sabe cuando está, eh, cuando la implement, implementación está uh, ido bien? ¿Cómo uno sabe que se está fallando? Si no implementan, eh, no es una actividad regular de la empresa. So, Michael, how does a company know that the implementation is going well? If it's not something that's a part of their day-to-day -day processes, um, they don't know what to look out for. So how do they know when the imp implementation is not going well? There, there, there's a lot of answers to that. So uh, let, let's start with simple, defining what success is and measuring it. And, and that happens at each of those milestones that I was talking about in the project planning. And also what failure might look like. And the idea is that you want to build on a solid foundation here. And also ensuring that um, you might want to think of a third party company like Tech to assist you during implementation to ensure that the company, that the um, project stays on track and that you're not going down a path that uh, doesn't make sense for the implementation and for your project. I have one last question. And mi última pregunta sería, ¿cómo es que sabemos que durante los eh, demo scripts que los proveedores están enseñando a nuestra empresa exactamente cómo va a funcionar este sistema en nuestra eh, empresa? So how do we know what the vendors are actually showing us is what will work within our own work environment? It sounds like you were listening. That's what happened in uh, waste management. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the answer here is that when the vendors come in to demonstrate, these are just not demonstrations. This is not a, you know, um, a show for the vendors. This is about presenting specific to you how you're going to use the solution. So what we do is we help our clients create these demonstration scripts, which outline the key use cases that they're going to need to run their businesses. So imagine the, the vendors take about a month to prepare their presentations. They often use the data from their clients, and these are specific scenarios that they are demonstrating on um, what it would be like to use their software in your business with your business processes. And so you're going through it keystroke by keystroke with it. You're actually asking the vendor to show you their audit log, and you're challenging them to say, you know, is this out of the box functionality that you're showing me? But in this way, you're able to compare one vendor against the other and be able to see what it would be like to use uh, the software. And you're evaluating just more than um, the software or ease of use, it's the processes. And um, it's a lot of different factors that are being evaluated. And that's why we create scorecards 
for our clients during these uh, important demonstrations. Thank you, Michael. Daniel, that was all the questions that I had today. Thank you so much. Vale, eh, muchas gracias Victoria por las preguntas. Bueno, voy a hacerle una última pregunta por mi parte a Michael y entonces os animo, tenemos un par de minutos. Bueno, tenemos todavía, si hubiera alguna pregunta, pues tenemos tiempo. He visto que hay gente que se ha incorporado últimamente, o sea que tenéis la ocasión, aunque luego podréis ver el vídeo de hacer preguntas. Os recuerdo, última vez, uh, podéis levantar la mano accionando el iconito levantar mano del panel de control de GoToWebinar y yo os abro el micro. ¿eh? Podéis plantear las preguntas tanto en español como en inglés y no se ve la webcam, o sea que tranquilos. ¿eh? Y solo voy a decir el, el nombre de pila para que nadie sepa eh, eh, quién está hablando. ¿eh? Eh, bueno, um, Michael, I, I would like to know uh, if tech works only with private companies, but well, private companies in European language, you know, because I don't know if, if it's the same in, 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 in the States. I mean, do you work also for uh, public companies? Oh, absolutely. Public absolutely. organizations? How, yeah. How... Yes, so, so we've worked with at all, all levels of um, public organizations. So think of it, um, cities and towns, we help them set up uh, software mm -hmm. for enterprise asset management, ERP, human resources. We've worked with um, um, state and um, uh, federal governments. We've worked with utility organizations and um, many public and um, non-government, non uh, non-profit organizations as well. Uh -huh. Because I suppose that uh, also public organizations, they have a lot of problems or they can uh, have uh, uh, failure projects also. Well, well, public, you know, public companies have a big challenge and that is their procurement process. So often public companies, uh, uh, Daniel, I hope you don't mind me going into a little detail here. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, so public companies go into, uh, they have a challenge with their procurement process. And that is a lot of public companies have to go to public tender. So then they lose control over who gets selected. But I would tell you that you don't lose control if you define what you need properly. And defining it, it's just not about the requirements, it's about, it's about all, all aspects. It's about the, 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 think of the list of 10 items that um, we went through that were get, tips and guidelines, choosing the right software and choosing the right um, in, implementer. And so it, um, and also being able to tie that into contracts. So there's a lot of say that you can get even with the public tender procurement process in terms of making sure that you choose the right solutions. Okay. Bueno, muy bien. Pues uh, thank you very much, Michael, for your explanations. Uh, muchas gracias, eh, Victoria, por tus traducciones. Gracias a los dos. Gracias. Thank you, everybody. Muchas gracias. <risa> bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias a todos los asistentes. Eh, ya sabéis, este es un nuevo webinar de los que estamos organizando desde hace unos meses conjuntamente IT Latino y Technology Valuation Centers. Uh, vamos a empezar a organizar estos webinars eh, directamente también para eh, audiencias de eh, inglesas, ¿vale? Pero lo haremos conjuntamente, tanto los mismos webinars en inglés los haremos tanto para audiencia española o es hispanohablante, perdón, uh, como a uh, la audiencia norteamericana y canadiense. ¿eh? Uh, <risa> así que eh, estaros atentos a próximos webinars. Tenemos un par de webinars uh, eh, de Technology Evaluation ya para febrero. Eh, que son los siguientes, uno sobre inteligencia artificial para manufacturing uh, y otro sobre, también relacionado con, con lo de hoy, sobre eh, cómo elegir un RP cloud y un RP on-premise, eh, cómo compararlos, ¿no? ¿Cuál, cuál, saber cómo, cómo, cuál nos, nos viene mejor. Así que, bueno, son webinars interesantes, no los perdáis, los tenéis en tecnowebinars.com y en demosdesoftware.com tenéis eh, una biblioteca, y este webinar también lo, lo publicaremos allí, una biblioteca de más de 3.000 webinars grabados, eh, que son unos cuantos. Así que cuando os aburráis, ya sabéis, os vais a la biblioteca y le echáis un vistazo a los vídeos. Nada más. Eh, desde aquí, desde Barcelona, uh, un saludo a todos. Adiós. Adiós. Adiós.
Gracias.